Right, welcome back everyone. Can we please give a very warm welcome to Rusty Russell, who is here to talk to us about having false fun with a Wiimote. Thank you. Okay. Right, okay. Um, welcome to my talk. As you heard, it's called False Fun with a Wiimote. Subtitle, One Geek's Battle to Breed Geek. Now, before all of my talks, I always do this. Um, I give a few things that if you get nothing else out of this talk, at least you'll hopefully gain something. Um, and this time I chose my CCAN project, which is like CPAN for C, only way, 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 way small. I think embryonic, but um, hopefully it will go somewhere useful one day. Um, and the other one's a bit left field. Um, Wikipedia actually have a list of the Pulitzer Prize winning, winning writing for various years, and many of those are actually available on the web for you to read. Um, and if you're ever really bored, then you should um, go through and read some really, some really top writing uh, through there. I actually lost a whole segment of my life uh, browsing that page downwards. Okay, even better time spent. There are three fantastic talks going on right now, and this one. So you guys chose wrong. Um, you want to be in one of these locations. Um, I particularly have a certain amount of um, empathy towards Liz Henry with her um, hackability, the idea that at some stage all of us will experience some kind of disability uh, and we should probably think about that is something that's really been driven home to me recently. So for some reason, that's the talk I would currently be in. Um, okay. So this is what it's going to look like. First, we're going to have an introduction. Oh, that didn't quite work. Um, first, we're going to have our introduction, as you can see up there. Um, then I'm going to tell you what I was going to do. Then I'm going to tell you what I actually did. Um, and finally, I'm going to tell you about all the lessons I learned along the way. Um, so with that introduction, oh, count them, first baby picture. Okay. Now, most parents say things like, look, I don't, you know, I don't mind how my, what my child does when they grow up. I just want them to be happy. Um, but things are a bit more complicated if you're a geek parent. Because what if your child turns out to be a happy Windows user? Um, you know, I think every, every parent, um, whether they're a geek or not, really hopes that their child will have some, be inherently special in some way. Um, but um, in my case, I really hope that she actually did have some kind of lasers embedded behind her eyes in her socket, the sockets, but apparently that's just an artifact of the, yeah. Disappointing. Um, now, obviously, I'm a strong advocate of supporting whatever your children want to do, and I have said to Arabella on numerous occasions that she can certainly be a ballerina when she grows up, as long as she can code at least as well as I can. <laughs> so. Now, when we look at geekiness, um, and you view the body of research out there on how you basically, you know, uh, ensure that your child is sufficiently geeky, um, researchers are really divided on this question as to whether it is nature or nurture. Summary is it's probably a lack of both. <laughs> but obviously early intervention is the key. Now, when you're talking about introducing programming to very, very young children, obviously you're not going to use a keyboard. I mean, the fine motor skills required to actually hit specific keys is something they don't gain until, until significantly later. Um, but, I happen to be the proud owner of an X-Arcade uh, joystick. Who's got one of these things? Yeah, okay. You're, you're among the privileged few, let's be honest. Um, this thing is awesome. Um, it has about 20 different arcade-style buttons and the digital joysticks that go eight ways. Um, and basically, any child who can sit up can actually use this joystick. And if they crawl, they can get to everything. So it becomes pretty obvious, therefore, that... <laughs> It's a little bit of adoption, uh, you know. The left one's the operators and the right one's the uh, identifiers. Um, yeah, yeah, operators are actually on the left uh, joystick and the right joystick is actually just A, B, C, D because, you know, um, they're not going to be writing complicated programs, let's be realistic. <laughs> now, my first attempt at this, unfortunately, was not perhaps uh, the kind of thing that gets you compliments on Linux kernel. I'd probably count it as a bit of a failure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, now, I, I can tell why you're laughing, okay? My mistake here is obvious. There's no point just putting, you know, this kind of input in front of a child without the required background. So, we go to Nooth, um, and, uh, 
<laughs> this is my baby coding shirt. Yes, it's true. Um, okay. Now, unfortunately, Nuth pretty much had the same effect on her that it did on me. Um, so perhaps that was a little bit too much background information. We should go for something a little bit more practical. Um, <laughs> not too out so well. Now, at this point, of course, I know you're laughing because, you know, clearly... This is an old-timer book, right? Hip kids these days are doing something, you know, young and funky. So I thought, okay, they can do that. Um, that really didn't work. She was really quite upset with, uh, with, uh, with Ruby. Um, this raises the obvious question. Um, I mean, if she's not an algorithm geek and she's not a C hacker and she's not a Ruby hacker, um, <laughs> you know... Uh, Illustrated here, trying to put the Pentagon inside the hexagon hole. I mean, come on. Um, so at this point, we rethink the plan. Um, and I read many, many years ago about a experiment done with really small babies, like sort of six months to nine months, um, where basically whenever the, the, the baby raised their arms, the researcher would turn the light on, and whenever they dropped them, they'd turn it off. And the child quickly learned that they could control the lighting by lifting and lowering their hands. Um, and one of the things that really struck, out, struck with me when I was reading this um, article on this, this research was one of the researchers saying, and the kids really, really love this game. And I'm like, well, that's good. They get to control their environment. Plus, it has, you know, um, circuitry in it. So it's a good introduction for a geek baby. There's two problems. One is with modern fluorescent bulbs, you've got that lag. Um, so with compact fluoros, you're not going to get the instant on behavior that that you're going to want. And secondly, I don't want to stand by a switch doing this, you know, like those researchers did with the clipboard. So, obviously, the next step is to attach some kind of infrared LEDs to the child's hands, use the Wiimote to track the LEDs, and then just as a simple matter of software to get this together. Okay. So, the software was pretty straightforward. Um, LibSeaweed um, already exists. Now, it just shows what, a, what kind of um, geek tunnel vision I have that I didn't get the pun for ages about libseaweed. Um, it's like, well, that's a C library for the Wii, and you know, there's a D on the end for some reason. Um, so maybe so you can write demons. I, yeah, just did not get it. Um, but it already exists, and I'd actually used this before for my Wii Pong project two years ago, um, so I had this on the shelf. Now, at this point, it's particularly important to talk about safety when you're building these things. Um, and frankly, this there's nothing quite like a sign on a device that tells you that this has killed children before to make a parent really pay attention. So in this case, when we're talking about software and child safety, obviously I was going to code it in Python. So, because we know how great Python is for children. So, yes. so rather than see, this is one project which I did do in Python. Um, and my first attempt was, was really quite simple. Um, the Mark I, from which you can tell this was not the last attempt, um, was basically a pair of mittens. Um, these mittens were double layer. This is actually the outer mitten, um, this tiny little mitten. Inside was a smaller mitten, and between the two was a battery hooked up to an infrared LED that poked out through a hole in this mitten. So when they held their hand like that, the infrared LED shone out and got detected by the Wiimote. Okay. Now, obviously this is very hand sensitive. I mean, she was going to outgrow this pretty damn quickly. Um, it's also very angle sensitive. That single LED angle meant that you could detect their hand when it was up there, as long as they fa face it perfectly towards the, the Wiimote. But when they turned it away, or they went like that, or they had it down there and beyond, you couldn't detect it at all. So perhaps it was OK if I did the, just the lighting thing, uh, and, and I actually had an app that did this, just lit the whole TV up on white or black, um, which, given it was a reasonable large TV, actually did provide lighting for the apartment. Um, but it's not all that good. And the other thing about mittens is kids really love taking them off. Um, so this actually was pretty much immediately eliminated. Um, I decided to go for a bracelet model. Um, this was suggested by uh, Kelly Yo, a friend of mine. And she said, well, maybe you should go for a bracelet rather than a mitten that, that you know, kids hate wearing. So, OK. So I go for a bracelet. Um, basically, a 12 mil wide. So this is about 12 mil wide here. Uh, velvet ribbon, so it's pretty. Um, and five splayed LEDs on the side. Um, I see a picture here. Uh, I basically just soldered them together so you get 
coverage from all the way up there to all the way down there. Um, the battery was actually sewn into the bracelet, um, which was going to be great until it ran out, ran out, and then I was going to have to actually unpick the sewing, pull it out, resolve the battery in, and sew it back together. Um, and three metal press studs around the bracelet like this. So the end of the bracelet actually had these press studs, and you can actually see that I've sewn it on uh, at least once with wire that's connecting the whole thing together. The idea was that when you clip it together, it turns on, you unclip it, it's off. So the bracelet itself forms the circuit. Um, the main bad point about this was this word, craft. Which brings us to distraction number one of why I didn't get as much done as I hoped to. Um, so, <laughs> there's this thing called blanket stitch that you're supposed to use for sewing things together that are like that, the edge of a blanket. Turns out it's not as easy as you would think. To sew that much takes an amateur, say, me, about five fingers and um, all of which ended up with holes in them and a good couple of hours. Um, so yeah, sewing actually turns out to be a lot harder than I thought. This is the other thing. Subscribing to Make Magazine is not the same as being able to make things. <laughs> I thought I'd paid my subscription, come on, you know. Uh, so yeah, it turns out that that actually was kind of difficult. So craft was one bad thing. The other thing is that I didn't place these uh, studs in particularly good places. So Arabella was a little bit too big for one of them, and I was going to have to wait for her to grow into the next size, and then she'd have this narrow window where it would work again, and then she was going to grow too much. So um, this, this fixed size range thing didn't actually really work all that well. So, not to be daunted, comes the Mark III. Basically, with the Mark III, I simply replaced the studs uh, with Velcro, because Velcro is awesome. And... Um, Actually, you can still see one of the studs there sticking through the anti-Velcro at the other side. Um, and I've sewn wire back and forth across the Velcro in the hope that when I close the circuit, it'll all work. Turns out, no bad idea. Um, there's just not enough force on the Velcro to create a reliable contact, so that one just would completely end on the starter. Okay, so the Mark IV turns up, and I abandon this idea that we would close it to make contact. Neat as it was, um, the actual making of contact turned out to have all these issues. So... Um, instead, I've just gone for a spade thing that you actually pull apart to deactivate and you plug it together. Um, it's a continuous piece of material. Um, and I actually went out and I ordered four wide angle infrared LEDs to help with the issue of sensitivity to particular angles. And I discovered one early morning when Arabella decided to play with my nipple ring that kids are a lot stronger than you think. And so using a tiny button battery was not necessary. She could quite easily throw one of these AAA batteries to the moon. So, um, and it turns out that you can buy AAA rechargeable batteries with the contacts already spot welded on the ends. So all you need to do is solve them up, which saves you this whole issue of trying to bind the connections to the batteries and try to solder them and stuff like that. So this turned out to be really cool. So this is what it looks like. Um, I actually have this one here. Um, that's everything sort of out. You can see the connections, and you can see the infrared LEDs. You can see the battery there. You basically tuck all that in um, to that loop. And in fact, at the bottom there is a little lip, and you can sort of tuck it underneath. You close those two and shove the whole thing in, and then you've got your infrared LED. So this is a video of the very first time that I put it on her. Unfortunately, it's actually sideways because I was being creative, and I still have to figure out how to rotate it well. So she's got it on her wrist, um, and in front of her, there's thumbs the Wiimote. Up, there's me going, do something. <gasps> now, she's figured out that something's going on on the screen. Um, she's not entirely sure that it's anything she's doing, but she's either scared enough of it, of it to move, or she's really getting this idea of, you know, I move and stuff happens, it's responding in some way. Not quite sure. She obviously hasn't, she never figured out that it was the hand with the bracelet that was interesting, but she'd move the other hand and nothing would happen, and she never really got that. Um, so there is this basic idea that, yeah, hunt up, hunt up. when she moves, stuff happens. There you can see she's actually going, okay, but the other hand, no, both hands up. So we did get some level of success. Yeah, On a very yeah. coarse level, stuff happens when she moves her hands. So that's a bit of a plus. Now, why is my baby sideways? Yeah, it's because I put the camera up that way and held, anyway.
yeah, it, it turned, it, in retrospect, that was a really dumb thing to do. It works okay with still photos, not so good with video. Um, okay. Now, progress stopped at this point for a few months. In fact, it's three months between this and the next step of progress. Um, see, somehow between the hacking and the sewing and the baby wrangle, um, I actually met this attractive young woman you can see here who's called Alex. Um, so I won't give you details, but, you know, there was some, you know, uh, needs to say, it was three months before I made the Mark V. Okay. So, uh, on your right, you can see... Uh, the Mark V there, and it's basically very similar to the Mark IV, except the scrunchy elastic that goes around is actually tighter. Now, these are not standard scrunchies. I actually made them and sewed them and everything else. Uh, this time I used a sewing machine. Um, but uh, it's actually quite a bit larger. The idea was that I'd be able to get my hand in it. I didn't quite succeed on that, but it actually turned out to be tighter as well. because Less elastic, but more material. Worked really well. Okay, so now I've got two, and this was always the plan, that I would have two that I would slap one on each hand, and track which one was which. So she'd have a red and a blue on the screen, and they would match what she's doing with her hands. Right? So, there we go. And you can see that as she moves her red hand, the blue one moves. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, we got it right for a second. No, we fucked up again. That's wrong. Okay, so, this is basic idea. Now, at this point, if something important happens. Watch her hands. Clap, 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 yay! We've been trying to get her to clap for about a month now. First time she decides to clap is when she's doing this, which is fantastic. It's a great development, you know, step in a, in a child's development, quite important. But pay attention to the damn screen, for God's sake. Anyway. <sighs> okay. There was another distraction. Um, see, I got Guitar Hero 4, and it, well, to her, and it has the drums. And it turns out that my eight-year-old niece... Uh, can actually get through Hotel California on easy on the drums, which is really quite impressive. Um, and she enjoys it a lot, but my five-year-old nephew and my three-year-old niece cannot. So I'm like, well, you know, uh, all I need is to hook up Lib Seaweed, which I've already got, and um, some sounds, and I can make a drum application for them that's really simple and they can all enjoy it. Okay, this is cool. So, well, it turns out it's not quite that cool because Lib Seaweed doesn't actually support the drums and it's kind of abandonware. So... Um, you know, there was a little bit of hacking involved. First, it turned out that actually they didn't use the right identification sequence. They'd hacked something up, so they weren't using the proper one that had been documented quite well on Wii Remote. So first I had to patch to, to change to fix up the way it actually identified devices, and then I actually just hacked in the um, identification for the World Tour drum kit, which is harder than you think because it actually had a fixed number. You actually had to add a new one and break the API. It's unfortunate. But uh, then hook up the reporting and then, of course, do the Python binding. So... You know, but it was all there, really. Uh, a few lines of code and just hand wave. And, yeah. um, and then, of course, I didn't have anywhere to send it because it was pretty much abandonware, so I just put it up on my blog and put a track bug entry saying, look over here. Um, and then came the big question of eyes. So, as you saw in that video, I really like using eyes for, for, for small children especially because they're really drawn to eyes. Um, kids, especially babies, go after eyes and high contrast. That's what it's all about. So... Kids love the eye effect, so I thought, well, I might as well have it when I bang the drums, eyes appear on the screen. The harder they bang it, the bigger the eyes. The random location, stuff like that. Um, because this brings the classic question, being not an artistic person, well, how, how do you draw an eye? So I consulted the classics, and <laughs> I measured out the rough ratio and went, that's what I'm going to do. So that's where my eyes came from. Um, sounds were actually even easier. There is... Uh, a uh, free software licensed set of professionally recorded uh, orchestral sounds. Uh, they're actually done by um, studio musicians at Open Path Music um, for use in Tim Tam and the XO activities. And you can just download that massive, I think it's even a zip file, but you know, it's basically this directory full of these random sounds. So that was actually much easier than you think. Now, although this was designed for the older there you children, go, there you go. I did decide, let's give hit, Arabella a go hit, on this hit, when she's about... Hit. 10 months old, you know. Yes. You yes, see the Wiimote yes. embedded there in the drums. It's good. It's she's good. got a drumstick. Harder. And she's Harder. banging. Quack, quack, quack. And I'm yeah, encouraging. It's good, yeah. It's good. Uh, good. Within that annoying good. baby voice that you hear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, the problem is yes, that she hasn't produced yes, anything on the screen yet. It's good. It's good. Because you actually have to hit these things pretty hard. That's why you have to use the drumstick and you have to hit it in the middle. 
this is really interesting because hitting it in the middle is the least rewarding place to hit the drums. It doesn't make much noise there, inherently. The edge makes a noise, but the centre of the drum, okay, whack, okay, not so whack. much. Okay. She finally hits, hits something in the right place, and yeah, I'll pan up yeah. a second. Because you hit it. Yeah. Hit it again, hit it again. Yeah. She tries hitting it with her hand, nothing happens. They're two blue ones she's hit before. Okay, so I was like, <laughs> okay, I did this again. So, everyone, uh, okay, you know, okay. So, something's happened on the screen. She's not quite sure how it happens. Um, right, now this bit is really important. At this point, um, she tries whacking it a couple of times, nothing yeah, works. Yeah, good, good. Daddy seems a bit excited, but really, it's waning, right? We're falling off the interest curve at this point. And sure enough, in a second. What happened here? What happened here? Did you get bored of the drums? Did you get bored of the drums? (laughs) (laughs) The ball, the ball. Which brings us to the moral here. the ball. If your child grows up using sporting equipment regularly, oh, come on, you know where that's going to lead. Um, so at this point, it is actually worth mentioning another distraction, which was exposing my, uh, my daughter to any random freaky shit that happened around the apartment. In particular, it turns out that... Um, when the, the tops from her bottles were in the sink and water was draining out, it kind of just freaked me. Ready? Ready? And... Weird, weird, huh? I don't know what's happening with the echo in there, but anyway. Yeah, so I spent ages with her sitting on the sink going, putting the water in, then tapping it, and it'd go, bloop, 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 bloop. and she'd look at it like it was haunted, and look at me, and I'd say, freaky shit, huh? And it. That's why I cut that one, because that's why I just said weird. Okay, so, anyway, LCA is fast approaching, and they've accepted this talk. So I'm like, right, time to radically simplify, because I have to actually get some results, otherwise I'll just be stuck here showing baby videos. Anyway, uh, so, it's time to simplify. So, let's just take the Mark V, one hand. I don't have any of those issues where I was having trouble tracking both hands and reliably telling which was which. I'll just do one. Uh, and the Mark V, she'd learnt to pull the other one off, so the Mark V it is. Okay. Um, and I wrote two simple programs uh, that should be fun to use. The first one is called Hand, um, and it's a baby hand on the screen. The idea is she moves and the hand moves, you know. Okay. Uh, sorry? Ah, right, so I actually looked for an image of a hand. I didn't have a good photo of her hand at the time, so I went, okay, let's find a picture of a hand. This is actually this is one of the problems with this kind of development, is that when you're sort of a part-time single parent, um, if she's there, I can't be hacking on it. So I had to wait till she had a nap or went to bed or handed it back to her mother before I could furiously hack, and then I'd get the next step. And then she'd try it again and go, oh, damn, I've got to fix that, but I can't now because, you know, I've got this child to look after. So... Um, so the model list developed happened when she wasn't actually there. So I couldn't just grab a shot of her hand. So I Googled for pictures of baby hands. <laughs> Turns out they're soaps. So if you think they're creepy now, imagine them worn down to the nub. Um, <laughs> needless to say, I elected to use this hand image instead. Uh, a little bit of gimping to get rid of that and put in some alpha. And we had a nice hand. So the other thing I did, and you'll notice this cleverness here, I used a ball. Can't beat them. Um, this beautiful SVG, um, a, a public domain image of a uh, of a baseball, um, was just in the perfect place. Turn it into a ping, and away it goes. Um, so there's a ball bouncing around on the screen as well. I wrote a second tiny app called Smear. Uh, this is basically because kids love smearing stuff almost as much as parents hate cleaning it up. So I thought, okay, let's go for Smear. There'll be um, paint pots on the screen, and they can smear them. Okay, so two very, very simple apps. There's only one problem. It turns out, who knew? Python is slow. Um, 
See, the first issue that I hit was that the Wiimote in its uh, non-polling mode, so basically when you say, tell me all the events, will actually shove an event at you 100 times a second. Now, if you're injecting this into the Pi game event loop and doing any work at all in your responding to events, you'll actually queue these up. The result is that the hand starts lagging further and further behind what's actually happening until you start getting errors and overflows and it all goes horribly bad. So this is something you should never do. I have a class IR source, blah, 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 and I define equality to be not really equality. And then if this point is the same as the last point, I don't even inject it in. Um, this says something about my quality of coding for this project where I'm furiously trying to get stuff done, that that code is still in there now. Um, so yes, you destroy the concept of equality and you catch up. It's all good. Um, the other problem I had, particularly with the hand, is that I originally had this beautiful piece of code that, with the overlap of the hand and the paint pot, would figure exactly the mask of paint that would be on the hand as a result, accumulating there on the hand. Um, and you would smear that beautifully, and it would slowly increase the alpha, so it would kind of run out of paint after a while. So you move the hand, and you hit the paint pot, and it stops like that until you rip the hand away, and then, yeah, no, it was horrible. Um, so more recent Pygame actually has a mask helper, which will give the intersection of two masks, but you still have to convert that back to a surface to paint it, and iterating through to convert something, or iterating through per pixel to change the alpha and stuff, just is not something you can really realistically do in Python at any kind of sane time frame. Um, so I actually ended up using this 8 by 8 hack, uh, where I basically just go, well, if this eighth of the hand overlap, then I assume paint's all on that eighth. Uh, that eighth. That actually works surprisingly well in practice, but um, but yeah, it explains some of the anomalies you'll see in the in the paint app. So. This is the first version of hand.py. In fact, the code is backwards. I thought it was a cool effect. The hand's actually sticky here. So rather than reflecting, it actually grabs the ball. Because um, I got the vector the wrong way. So you can actually hold the ball. Now, she's holding on there. And she's kind of you know, looking at me a lot as I'm pointing and gesticulating. And not really looking. She's pointing at the ball, but with the wrong hand. So really, not a huge success for the hand thing. Okay. So the, so the issue of which hand is, and this is something the parents really about, oh, she's left-handed. It's possible because her grandfather's left-handed. He's actually ambidextrous, which would be even cooler. But um, uh, if you put it on her right hand, she's left-handed. If you put it on her left hand, she's right-handed. Um, it is a slight encumbrance, and she tends to use the other hand for stuff. As far as I can tell, at this stage, she hasn't developed a hand bias. That's right. Okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, I like tying a free hand behind her back. It's low tech. Um, it fits with the rest of the talk. Um, okay, the point is, um, at this stage, I'm thinking perhaps there's too much abstraction between what's going on. But speaking of abstraction, I'm going to go to distraction number five. You see, one evening, uh, Alex and I stayed up late with 125 LEDs, uh, batteries, and magnets, and creatively vandalized a sign, uh, the back of a sign at the entrance to... Uh, uh, the Southern Expressway in Adelaide um, with lead throwies, because we just thought it was cool. Um, so, yes, unfortunately we don't have any particularly great shots, but it was a lot of fun to do. For those of you who don't know, the Southern Expressway is this crazy three-lane highway in Adelaide that goes one way for half the day and then inverts and goes the other way for the other half of the day. Um, so this meant that during the night cycle, early morning cycle, uh, sorry, the, the night cycle, people could actually see this because you're always approaching the back of the sign. And it's just visible long enough for them to go, what kind of... And it's gone, which I thought was really, really sweet. Um, so it's also near a bridge so we could take pictures. But yeah, so we waited for the, the inspection car to go down. Then we you know, ran onto the thing and we just throwing these lead throwies up. Uh, it turns out that signs in the modern day are made of aluminium. So the actually only thing it sticks to is the struts. But anyway, the point was that, yeah, that, that, um, yeah. And then, well, what do you do? Because you've got LEDs left over. Um, and Alex, you know, mentions this cool neighbor that has, like, this total Christmas bling lights happening. And I'm like, well, but I've got 60 LEDs. So you um, end up, you know, wiring up a little thing with the... It turns out, actually, soldering together 60 LEDs, longer than you think. Um, and, uh, yeah, and remembering high school electronics turns out to take even longer. Um, but it works. It's incredibly bright, actually. It's really a bit of a spotlight of uh, the LED decorations because they're high-brightness LEDs. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's nice and visible. So that was the other random distraction. But, anyway, direct mode. So we decided that it was too abstract before. 
So what if we flip things around? And at this stage, we've got like two weeks to LCA. So I'm ready to try anything. So you put the TV on the ground rather than up high. Um, you put the Wiimote facing the screen, and you put the wristband on backwards so the LEDs are shining backwards toward the Wiimote. Then you have to hold it still in various points to mark the corners of the screen, and they can just wave their hand on the screen. This is a more direct way of doing it. Now, the problem is that the image that you see out of the Wiimote is actually distorted in some way because it's up off at an angle, or at least it's upwards, got some perspective on it, and you want to map that onto coordinates on the screen. Now, I'd already solved this for Wii Pong. That code was in C, um, so therefore unsafe for children. I'd also solved it for Whiteboard, this project that um, I helped a high school student do for her science project. So we actually already had this code in Python. Um, and I have no idea how you're supposed to do this, but this is the approach I took. Um, my theory was that for any point, the ratio between the lines on the sides should be constant. So A to B should be the same when you map it onto the screen. That seems kind of reasonable to me. Um, and same for the X and Y. So therefore, you take the formula of a line. You've got your two calibration points. You do some subtraction and blah, 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 blah. That turns out to be M over there. So straightforward algebra. There you go. Um, that gives you the, uh, for given X, it gives you what the Y would be at that point on the line. Um, and then you've got the inverse operation, which is you know, given the uh, Y, what's the X value. And then, basically, to figure out the screen coordinates, you figure out how far it is to the left, how far it is to the right, and then left over left plus right times by 1024. You can see I've hard-coded the screen size in here, which is pretty crappy, but you know it works. Gives the X screen coordinates and Y screen coordinates. So very, very simple code to map once you've got your calibration points. I just had to put some code in there so you weren't you know, going, he had absolutely nothing. Um, I might have been able to get away with it if I had a mad scientist outfit, but given I don't, had to have some content. OK, so this is Arabella playing in direct mode. Sorry, Paul. Good, good. Bounce, 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 wings, wings. That goes freaky. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, so it actually works. Good, I mean, the good. thing is that she's as much bounce, trying to touch bounce, the hand bounce. as the ball. <gasps> well done, well done. But whatever well she does, done. something happens. And so she gets that immediate feedback. <laughs> this was much easier. there. She's waving a hand and stuff, and it's waving, and, you know, so... It's a lot closer to having control, which is really good because that was like two weeks ago and I had to go for... Okay. Oops, that was the, that was the wrong button. Well done. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, I will now find where I was in my talk. And Okay. So, this is, this, is, this is just an example of OpenOffice being awesome. What? Yeah, okay. So, um, rental apartment, not my TV. Uh, but it does bring back another interesting point, um, which is, um, okay, I had a couple of other test subjects. Um, my goddaughter was visiting, so um, her four-year-old brother tried this, and we got him to use it in direct mode. Um, the result looked a little bit like that. Um, we've actually lifted the TV back up to use indirect mode, but this is with the smear, smear one. He's actually smeared quite well. There were two things we have to overcome with this. Firstly, he had been told never, ever, ever, ever touch the TV. Once I understood what the problem was, it was simple to convince him that this was a special TV that was designed to be smeared by hand. The other thing is that he thought about it too much. He's, he saw these little LEDs, he knew they were doing something, and so he's bending his wrist forward to try to point them at the TV. Because between not being able to touch the TV and having a special magic bracelet on, he knew that the LEDs were doing something. When we got him to ignore all that and unlearn that, he used direct mode really well. Uh, first to bat the ball around and then to actually paint. Now, I also tried on my goddaughter, who's seven, um, and here you can see she's actually in indirect mode, and that worked really well. Um, she would use that really well. The only problem is when they get excited, they tend to approach the TV. So then they fall outside the range of the Wiimote, off the edges, and you've got to kind of pull them back and pull them back and pull them back. So you're continually kind of going, no, 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 get, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, this isn't a problem playing Wii games for adults because um, we're essentially lazy, we sit on the couch. Um, but kids get excited and they move forward. So... Um, now, we have one more test subject, um, and she's actually in the audience. Um, so I was going to borrow... <laughs> I was going to uh, borrow, like, a, a two-year-old for this. Um, but uh, you may spot there has been a subtle substitution here. I'm not using a real two-year-old. Um, 
just plug this together. Um, because, you know, what they say about working with um, animals and children, I thought, no, a demo plus animals and children is particularly bad. So I, I got rid of the kitten that was supposed to be involved in this demonstration, and I optimized the two-year-old out. So here we have the very, very hastily constructed, put together uh, Mark 5. And down there is a Wiimote. So if our volunteer could up and catch. Cool. Um, and I'll just escape out of this. So you'll get to see. Um, yeah. I'm going to try something high risk and actually switch my display on the fly. Uh, okay. See something? Cool. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so. Can you, yeah, can you hit the one and two buttons simultaneously on the Wii? The, the Wii is a Bluetooth device, basically, with an infrared camera at the Wiimote. So can someone hit the one and two buttons simultaneously? OK, and it should sync. The one and two, did you hit? Yep, OK. So hopefully it's syncing now. Put it upside down and tilt it down a little bit. So yeah, put the cord underneath it so it aims down, because uh, our two-year-olds aren't that tall. OK, so there we go. There we have our two-year-old who can hopefully smear the dot happening there. Okay. And the rule is, and if, if, if she could leave it alone for a moment, um, <laughs> sorry, you'll get a wobby pop afterwards. Um, <laughs> when, when, if they get bored with a colour, they get a fresh one. So random colour in a random location. So needless to say, they can make a whole heap of mess with this, um, and kids really like it. I mean, the only issue I have is that this app doesn't actually save their art. Uh, turns out that's important for kids, rather than going hitting escape and seeing it all vanish. Um, it's important to them. So I probably should actually come up with something that dumps it. The other thing is, because of the hacky optimizations I had to use, I never implemented multiple paint pots, which I thought would be cool to have more than one thing on the screen at a time. So, um, And you can see here, if you look carefully, the sharp edges are caused by this 8x8 hack, rather than using pixel-perfect intersections. So um, there you go. You get a whole range of fun colors to play with. Um, I actually have a bright color selection algorithm uh, that ensures that it's a certain geometric distance from black, uh, otherwise it picks again, um, which I had from previous things. So, yeah, basically they get things in random locations. And, and the seven-year-old really liked this. Um, I think it's perhaps a bit advanced. Uh, really young kids love the ball. Um, they thought that was awesome. Um, but it's very limited. You hit the ball around the screen and it bounces. Uh, you hit it faster, it bounces faster, and you, can, you, know, you can't really do much with it. Whereas this, you can actually, you know, th this definitely expresses control. You have to have finer control to use something like this, but it's got a bit more growth potential because they can change colors by waiting um, and having it shrink um, and getting a new one. So seven-year-old was actively going, no, I don't like that color, and waiting and getting a new one, going, okay, I like that one, smearing it a bit, going, mm, okay, and done and wait. So that actually was something that really was really good. I didn't have to really tell her that. She just figured it out. So, okay, thank you very much for our volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can play ball afterwards. Um. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hmm. Now, let's see if this works at all. Uh. Okay. That goes here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Cool. So, okay. Um. We had our other test subjects. We go through that. Okay. Now, conclusions. Um, the first conclusion is actually you should build robustly. And this is more important than you think. I mean, basically, I'm not entirely convinced that there's no circumstance under which this battery could get hot because it's shorted out, um, which meant that or that the child couldn't actually chew off one of the LEDs if they tried hard enough. It meant I had to supervise all the time. And for kids, exploration is slow. As you saw, Arabella would spend a few, you know, a minute at most doing something, wander off and do something, and then want to come back. That means you're dealing with hours of time sitting there watching. So if you want to do this properly, you want it to be um, robust. So that basically you can just leave it on them and, and go away. And as long as you don't leave it on them overnight, you should be fine. Um, which raises the whole question of, should I really be using IR LEDs and batteries for this at all? Um, make it reliable. If it doesn't work for them the first time, if it gives them the wrong feedback and sends them off in the wrong direction, the ball will win. In this case, that probably means using two cameras, particularly from the direct version, because it was too easy for them to occlude the view. 
if the dot for paint appeared in front of their body, they'd naturally reach for it, but it wouldn't work because they're blocking the camera. So two cameras in that case probably would have really helped. And when you combine the fact that it should be built robustly and make it reliable, infrared was probably the completely wrong choice for this. It was that I had, you know, every, you know, when you have a hammer, and I had my slip seaweed and Wiimote hammer, um, but really, brightly coloured scrunchies around her wrists and a couple of webcams uh, would have pushed a lot more of the problem into the domain of software, where I'm more comfortable for a start, but secondly, it would have been much more robust. The other issue is that I had the Wiimote on a chair. Arabella has learned when she hits a button on the Wiimote, it blinks for a while as it looks for a Wii to play with. So that's awesome. So whenever she got bored, she'd walk over to my carefully calibrated Wiimote, pick it up off the chair, and hit buttons. Um, cameras out of reach, for example, that are fixed somewhere would have been really, really good. Um, the final thing is make it trivial. I mean, it's nice to have extensions. It's nice to have extensibility, stuff they can explore that opens out, but not if you sacrifice trivial. Kids only have these really short attention spans, and they actually like stuff that's really, really simple. A lot of the stuff you see is far too complicated, particularly for this age group. We're talking the under twos. So it's really hard to force your brain to think simple enough. And that was my main problem with the early stages. Um, although I still think the whole XRK joysticks with uh, keyword buttons on it has got a future. Okay, um, and obviously I want to thank everyone involved. Um, Arabella, my test subject, um, my uh, mum for teaching me how to sew and for having a sewing machine, um, and Alex, my co-conspirator, for actually helping me break a few bylaws by throwing lead throwies and building them all and taking photos and stuff like that. Oh, and of course, um, uh, Pia Longstocking, our, uh, <laughs> uh, our demo helper here. Well, that is it. Um, I am happy to take questions if we have time. Did you consider um, strapping the remote to the child? Did I consider strapping um, the remote to the child? You could do cool things like tell whether they're actually standing up in their cot at night. Yeah rather than lying down and going to sleep. And so stuff. yeah, using, using the rest of the capabilities of the Wiimote, so the Wiimote also has um, uh, th basically, yeah, three um, accelerometers, thank you. Um, so you can tell which direction it's in because of gravity, obviously. Um, and you can also tell motion and things like that. You can also make it rumble. Um, so you could, for example, have some code that says, okay, when she's sitting up, it will rumble and annoy her and play annoying noises till she lies down again. That... <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, so there's, there, I think there's a difference between building like this handcrafted scrunchie that's really quite pretty in beautiful bright colours for my child, which is an act of love, versus strapping them to electronics. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think the child protection people will see those two categories quite differently. At least that's my hope. Um, so, no, I didn't actually think of strapping the remote to it, but... Um, uh, what's interesting is kids are a lot stronger than you think, so you actually can mount them up with quite a lot of cyborg-like material before they'll fall over. <laughs> <sighs> Any other questions? Uh, did you consider smearing the paint colours together, or did that just make you go, oh, too hard, my brain hurts? The question of smearing the paint colours together is a good one. Um, originally, that was what I int fully intended to do. So by having a pixel-perfect map of what paint was on their hand that degraded slowly... If they put their hand through multiple paint pots as they were going to be, they would get this nice combined effect. I mean, alpha blending would basically just do that work for me. So that was going to be pretty straightforward. Um, unfortunately, I'd have to go back and recode it in C, which means, you know, um, I don't really want to deal... You know, I'm in the emergency room going, what happened? I go, there was this buffer overflow. Um, <laughs> C was ugly. Just, you know. So, yeah. Um, that actually I think would be real. I mean, there's a lot of obvious improvements to this, but you always battle that thing as a... Trivial actually works really well. So how do you do it without making it too complicated? When you look at older kids, smearing paint colors together would actually be kind of awesome. Is the code available? Is the code available? It will be. Um, it's really awful Python. Take somebody who's a C programmer who is coding against a horrible deadline and figures they'll clean it up and then doesn't. So you add these three factors together, you've got some of the worst Python in the world. However, I will put it out there under a pseudonym and it will be available. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Have you thought about applying it to other situations like TV, doing away with TV remotes or something like that? Applying it to other situations. Um, this is um, not really, no. Um, I, I still think the cause hack was that the Wii Pong worked really well. 
Um, it worked well for sort of left five and up age group um, that are much easier to write programs for. Um, I mean, this was really about how do I make something that's useful for somebody that young? Um, and that was the angle that I was really, really spending a lot of brain power on. You know, what, what, what kind of things can they get? Um, what power of abstraction do they and do they not have? Um, you know, people were quoting studies at me about various children. I was going, well, that's why this isn't working, because she's too young. Um, so I was really trying to explore right down that end where there really isn't all that much. Um, once a kid can use a keyboard and mouse and everything, they, there's, there's a whole heap of stuff that they can do. Um, but trying to go, well, what's the poss simplest possible control mechanism was really what I was aiming for here. Um, do you have any more plans for the future? Do I have any more plans for the future? Um, <laughs> that's a very vague question. Um, you know, uh, and quite personal, really. Um, <laughs> I was thinking after this I might see another talk today, and then... Um, I'm looking forward to dinner. Uh, that should be good. Um, I mean, really, I think if I was going to continue this, I would basically go for webcams um, and do it that way. Brightly colored scrunchies around the wrist. I control the environment because I dress her every morning, so I can control what colors are involved. It shouldn't be too hard to pick something that was really distinctive and then basically track that. And once I've got that part done, it's, the world's my oyster as far as what I do with that. And as she grows and develops, I can get more interesting stuff that can be done by simply her manipulating her, her arms. Um, the other thing is to build things that I can wear as well, because then I can do things that are actually really cool. At the moment, I can't fit into either of these. So really, it's not that interesting from my direct perspective. Another you, question? Yeah, you just, you just kind of answered it a bit. I was just wondering what, uh, to your left, Rusty. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, I was just wondering um, what kind of ideas you have for you know, pushing the idea a bit further when she gets a bit older. Like, yeah, um, that's basically it. I mean, I think... Yeah. Um, I think, as I said, reliability is cool. I mean, if, basically, if I had these scrunchy things around her wrist that I could just leave on her the whole time, and when she wandered over into that area of the room, something would happen. If she wandered away, she could play with stuff and then come back. Um, that would be a much better model for, you know, every so often. You just don't get that many codec moments when you've got that, that length of time. So you want to come back and go, when the hell did she learn that Easter egg that I put in? Um, that's the kind of thing that you want. So you could build things that are more complicated, that take them longer, and then just let them go. Um, I, I saw a, a Wii software demo, I think it was one of Johnny Lee's, where uh, rather than having the infrared LEDs be attached to the control point, you, you used, uh, yep. projected the LEDs from near the remote and then used reflective tape. Did you yep. consider something like that? Yeah, actually, I really thought about using something passive uh, for the simplicity aspect, right? Uh, just basically drenching my child in infrared and um, have the reflection come back. Um, yeah, uh, turns out babies are really, you know, um, uh, delicate things, and um, I decided not to, I decided I didn't have the research background to know whether or not there was going to be adverse effects for that kind of drenching in straight into our eyes. Okay, we've got one time for one more question. Yep. Um, Real-time image analysis in Python, how sleep deprived are you? <laughs> okay. Um, no, no, if I, honestly, if I, if I were to do the image analysis style rather than just this style, um, and to be clear, the Wiimote actually spits out the coordinates. There's a dot here, 1024768 grid, done. It's actually backwards, which is why I flipped the Wiimote over uh, rather than actually fixing it up in my code. So it's like, oh, that was wrong. Ah, done, excellent. So the Wiimote's actually always upside down. Um, yeah, and, and that turns out to be really easy. You basically just grab the input and, and you get the numbers. You don't actually have to do any scanning. Uh, if I went for webcams, obviously that would change. Um, ideally, I'd create a nice little funky unit that sat on the webcam and basically did the analysis for me and spat back the answer. But that's going to have to be something more powerful than Arduino if it does it. So probably easier just to get the USB feeds in. And you know, ideal, the ideal setup, of course, is an eight by eight. Those are sort of eight cameras, all pointing at them. So there's no occlusion issues, and you've got full 3D. Uh, you can calibrate it by throwing something through and doing the complex math, and it'll figure out where everything is. And then you know you basically just wander in through there with a certain color, and it'll track it on the screen. And um, yeah, and that won't be done in Python. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.